Hi, everyone. Welcome to Boston Python presentation night. It's May 17th, 2022. We have a half dozen or so short talks tonight. Um, if you are interested in the group, come and find us at about.bostonpython.com. We have a Slack workspace. We're very friendly, and we're always interested in meeting new people. Uh, our first speaker tonight is uh, Juan. Juan, are you ready to share your screen? Yeah. Um, let me see if this works. Does it work? It works. How's this? It looks good. All right. Should I just go for it? Go, go for it. <laughs> uh, so, hey guys, um, I'm Juan. Uh, after many years in the industry, I, I decided to go back to school for a PhD and, um, and so and, and work in research. And so I, I now work at, um, at the Plasma Lab at UMass Amherst and um, advised by, by Emery Berger. And tonight I'm gonna talk about Slipcover, which is a, a new fast um, code coverage tool that we put together. Um, I'm making no assumptions. So I'm gonna start with what is code coverage? I'm not assuming that everybody knows uh, what that is. Let's say you've written some Python and you've written some tests for it. Um, and my test will be in PyTest uh, format. And uh, you can run them, um, you know, you can say PyTest your, your code or you could build them as a module, doesn't matter much. Uh, you could run them and, and maybe you get a green line, but then you ask yourself uh, how much did it test? Are there any cases you missed and things? So you could use um, our own ads uh, package for this. Uh, you could uh, load uh, an ad. Um, Preload coverage, the coverage run in, in PyTest, your tests run normally. Uh, then you ask coverage for a report. For example, I'm asking for an HTML report. And you might get a report like this uh, where it shows, oops, my tests are not testing the uh, X, sorry, the Y greater than 20 case. So that line that is dependent on it never gets executed. And, and so th this is one good reason to measure code coverage, to guide your testing, uh, to make sure your tests are exercising all the code, uh, that you're hitting as many lines as possible. Lines is not the only measure of coverage, you know, there's branches and other things. Um, you could use, uh, you could measure code coverage to, to find uh, maybe dead code that you can remove if you're running that in production, um, if you can run it in production. And, and coverage in general is used for other things. There is fuzzing, automated testing that, that can happen, but that's maybe for a different talk. Um, so how does this work? And, and big asterisks here, uh, Mads, Mads um, code is actually a lot more, <laughs> a lot more advanced than this, but it, you know, is the more equivalent of using Python's traceback functionality. So Python, you can, you can define a function and say, hey, whenever you have a, whenever certain things happen, uh, call back to my function. And uh, one of the events that you can get is a line uh, event is whenever you reach the new line. So for example, if it's executing and you reach the first line, my callback would get called. And, uh, and then in the coverage ad, it could be adding to a set or, or you know, storing the information. And so the, the guess the next line, you get the callback again. I skip over that because I didn't, uh, I didn't cover that one. And, but in principle, whatever lines you're doing, you're getting the callback. And at the end, you have the results. That's you, you ask for a report and, and ask the results. Um, so, so that's amazing, that's great. Um, but unfortunately, tracing adds overhead, right? Your program runs slower. You, you gotta pay something for it. Uh, SK learned, so these are some of the measurements we, we did trying with coverage PY. Uh, SK learned is the scikit learn uh, test suite. Uh, Flask is it's a test suite. And a few are from the PyTest, um, sorry, the PyPerformance. Uh, uh, benchmarks and then Sudoku is somebody's uh, Sudoku solver. 
um, you can see it can go in Cymark is extreme, it's almost three times slower than, than normal execution. In, in suites, as far as I've seen, it tends to stay around 30%. So how, how bad is that? It depends on how big your suite is, right? If, you, if you're SK learn, it takes several minutes to run, that's 30% of, of several minutes. So, so the problem with, with uh, dealing with this overhead is this slow you down. If, you're, if you have a workflow where you making a change and you're running a test and you're making a change and you're running a test, nobody has extra time in the day, right? And, and so it may lead to less testing. And uh, certainly if it made my program, my, my core uh, product 100% slower or, or worse, even 30% might be too bad. Certainly I'm not gonna try and run this in production to, to uh, see where it's not reaching and, and things like that. So, so the dream was, uh, so what, uh, what if we could get rid of this? And, and that's, what we, we, uh, that's what we figured how to do. Um, we, so far, and I, I'm waiting for the day in which I add something and we have to uh, scale it down, but right so far, uh, we're staying around 3%, 5%, so really, really close to the normal execution time. We, we get this done, by, by using a new approach. Instead of using the, the um, tracing functionality from Python, we, we go and instrument the bytecode and also de-instrument it when it's no longer needed. Because once you, you've hit the line, you know that it's, it's been covered in your test. It's covered you know, forever for that execution. It's, you don't never need to, to gather information about it anymore. And so we say the, the, the overhead slips off um, and, and uh, yeah. Uh, hey, I'm a dad, I joke. Um, anyway, so how do we do this? Um, it's going back to that Python, uh, piece of Python code. Uh, when you want to execute this, Python actually turned this into a bunch of bytecode. You don't need to understand this for the, for the talk, you, you may very well, but um, what, what we do with that is we take that bytecode and so this is slip cover, uh, it goes and looks up for where each line starts in, in there's, comp there's complexity around that already. But you see here on the left, there's lines four, five, six, and seven. So we go and insert a little bit of code ahead of each line um, that tracks where that, that, that line is being executed. And then we give this, this bytecode on the right to Python to execute, right? So it goes and executes the first line and we de-instrument it because we know it reached that line. It goes to the second line and, or the fifth line and, and it, it gets de-instrumented. It skips the sixth line, goes to the seventh line. And, and so we retain the instrumentation for the sections where we haven't seen it reach yet. So if, if it runs into that, we'll see it. We'll know we'll add modify our data. And doing this, we got uh, really low overhead coverage. Anyway, slip cover is available now for wherever you get your Python modules. It's in PyPy, it's on GitHub. Uh, we, we do build with the magic of GitHub, we, we build wheels for, for Linux and Mac OS and Windows. I have tests running for all these, uh, for all these platforms. And uh, shameless plug, if you like slip cover, or even if you don't, um, we have other Python projects uh, that are going on in our lab. Uh, Scalene is a very, uh, um, very precise, very uh, advanced profiler. It gives you CPU, memory, and GPU information. So uh, gives you a good view of, of what's going on. I'm, I'm also involved in this project. Anyway, plasmaumass.org is how you find out more, but Scalene is on on uh, in the same place as PyPy and GitHub and, and a few others. Anyway, eight minutes, that was my, that was my talk. Okay, thank you. Um, do people have questions for Juan? Thank you, Juan, this is very impressive. I remember- That was a really that. nice talk, Juan, yeah, good well. job. Thanks. Hey, Juan, I was curious. Hey, Mark. <laughs> How you doing? Um, good. So I don't have much of any Python experience. I do Perl, C, uh, so in C programming, doing testing, oftentimes we have the problem 
that we call Heisen bugs, uh, that when you mm -hmm. add the testing infrastructure, the test comes out differently and you don't hit the bug in the, that you were trying to find. Right. I don't know. It happens everywhere. Common, is this a common problem in Python or is it not so common in the Python community? How much does avoiding changing the timing uh, factor into the motivation for this? Yeah, uh, Heisen bugs and the opposite, Bohr bugs, they, they happen wherever testing happens pretty much. Except on my tests because I, I, they're perfect. And no, really, um, I mean, it, it, it's totally, it will be a totally independent discussion from, from um, slipcover. Uh, you know, there's pros and cons to having a Heisenberg for in one, one way you can retry them. So they're kind of soft bugs that way, but they're soft also that they're very hard to squish. It's very hard to, uh, to find them. Um, well, I guess I'm making to... an assumption that I, that I didn't make explicit. So I was thinking that you could just run slip cover to get code coverage on your production code and not just on a test suite. Is this only good for checking what you've tested or can you see in production which code has gotten hit? You, yes, you, you could just run it. You could run this in, in production. The, the overhead is, at least as far as the overhead goes, it's low enough that you could run it in production. Um, we don't, Slipcover currently doesn't keep track of like a timeline of where it was executed. In fact, as soon as you reached uh, a line, it's gonna de-instrument and it's not, no longer going to record that. So you might be able to use it for debugging depending what, what on the nature of what is it you're debugging. But you totally, you could run it in production because of the low overhead. Um, you do have to stop it at some point to, to get the, the data, the report, but, uh, or you could ask me to change it in some way that it, <laughs> it gives you the data in between, but um, yeah, so that's. Uh, um, I can tell you yeah. that as from experience with coverage.py that no matter how much you think it can't affect the outcome, someone will have a weird edge case where even the simplest thing you do during testing actually changes what the program does. Unfortunately, I don't. I don't know anything about the instrumentation here and what it what it might affect. But there's there's going to be someone whose results come out differently, and I don't have no idea how. Um, James, you've got your hand up. Yeah, uh, great talk, Juan. Um, do I understand correctly that because you're instrumenting the bytecode, this is exclusive to CPython? Um, or can you comment yes. on, uh, is there potential here for other implementations? Yes, thank you. I, I forgot to mention, we so far the approach has been CPython specific. Um, I mean, I, I, I love the, the other, all the other things that are <laughs> picking my mouth delights with all, but I, I love a lot that, that, that happens in Python, but um, it, we started with CPython, we saw this approach and, and we took it. I don't know to what extent we could do the same thing. Uh, I mean, instrumentation does happen in, in native code and has, has been done in, in other situations. Um, so I'm not sure yet in which direction the research will, will, will keep going. Uh, we're working on branch coverage now, which we don't uh, have yet. Um, there's a few other issues that are open on, on, on GitHub. Um, but then there is the bigger question of how do we, how do we do we continue the research in some, in some way that uh, looks promising? Cheers. Um, John? I decide how long to go for questions. Sorry about that. I had one question. Um, I don't know if you've done any uh, investigation of this, um, but I'm curious whether your instrumentation approach is inherently faster, i.e. whether it's whether it's the removing of the instrumentation that is responsible for the speed up, or if it's just the um, the mechanism that you're using might be faster than the, um, the internal Python. The reason I'm curious about that is because um, I'm, I'm interested in not only uh, necessarily did this ever get hit, but also how many times did it get hit and uh, maybe even what lines hit it. Uh, so I'd like to know, I'd like to be, I'd be curious about investigating more about the coverage than just 
didn't get hit one time. Um, if you want to run with that, go ahead. <laughs> I was muted. <laughs> um, yes, uh, it, it's a mixture. Um, you for so so the the instrumentation is is simply a speed up, right? Um, if if the information you want is have I hit this set of lines? Or what's the set of lines I hit? Um, then, um, then the instrumentation becomes just a speed up, uh, which you have to um, amortize in a sense. It takes some cycles to go through the code and, and uh, the, the, the truth of the matter is we don't entirely remove the instrumentation. We kind of put a jump over it and, and we try to make that process really fast and, and streamlined, but um, it does still cost does some, some CPU. So um, we have a parameter that after a certain number of hits, these, these the instrumentation would happen. Um, you do get a speed up even if you don't the instrument at all. We, there's a way you can, you can do that. Um, uh, you, you, there's a threshold parameter in slip cover, you set it to minus one and you just don't get any of the instrumentations done. Um, but um, we, we experimented a little bit and, and came up with a good default. I think it's a good default. Yeah, so, so, so it's a mixture of the two. Thank you, thank you for that. And, I, and so, I would be interested. I would be interested in hearing more about your your what you're thinking of gathering and how that would help you in in um, you know whatever it is that you're doing. Oh, we could take that to the Slack maybe. Slack or Project Night could be a good place to have a deeper conversation. I know I have lots of questions about what the future of this could be. Sounds good. Um, thank you, Juan. This is this is great. I, as the author of coverage and the guy who's been maintaining it for low these many decades, I am pleased to have other entrants on the field, um, and maybe we can uh, collaborate and get the best of both worlds. That would be kind of amazing. Yeah, that would be awesome. I, I look forward to that. Um, so I know we had said that we were going to do things in the order that that's on the page, but I'm going to switch the order just a little bit because Deb Nicholson has joined us. Um, Deb, are you ready to go? Sure. Um, everyone can hear me? I can hear me. Yes. <laughs> okay. Hi, it's so great to see everyone. Let me give you a little bit of an introduction, Deb. Okay, I'll let you do that. Okay. So. Uh, I was pleased, I no, I was dismayed earlier this year when I heard that uh, Eva, the longtime director of the Python Software Foundation was stepping down. And I thought, what's gonna happen? This is like, you know, George Washington had a 20 year term and it finally someone else is gonna have to step in and we have no idea what it's gonna be like. And it's terrifying. And then I saw the news that the Python Software Foundation had hired Deb Nicholson to be the next director. And I thought, this is great. We got our, I don't know, Thomas Jefferson or something. Though my metaphor wasn't well thought out. Um, but I'm really happy about this, partly because Deb is one of us. Deb, I first met Deb at Mead Hall in Cambridge after a Boston Python event. Um, and she's been a member for a while. She was a co-organizer for a while. She was handling the O'Reilly books coming in to, for as giveaways or something like that. Um, so I'm really excited about having Deb here to tell us about the Python Software Foundation and make her triumphant return into the Boston Python world. Uh, I feel like she's kind of been called up to the major leagues or something, but uh, is still always welcome here. So uh, Deb's here to tell us about the Python Software Foundation and, and answer our questions. Hi, Deb. Uh, thank you so much, Ned, for the uh, invitation and for the lovely introduction. Um, yeah, uh, and I, I did end up uh, being a co-organizer for a long time. I was sending out the uh, other events you might be interested in email and actually right. just got like just a week before I announced that I was going to be the new executive director, got a note from someone to my personal email asking if I was still running the other. So um, I, uh, 
I was organizing for a while and then I got a job that involved a lot of travel. So I passed the baton and um, all these years though, still whenever someone has said to me like, oh, I've always thought about programming. I said, well, you know, Python's a fantastic language. And if you're in the Boston area, you should definitely go to the Boston Python meetup. So I've been sending people over to you the whole time. Just Great. So, you know. um, so PyCon happens every year. This year was in Salt Lake. Next year is going to be in Salt Lake. Uh, the next year after that is going to be in Pittsburgh, which we were going to go to before. And then we're going to go to Pittsburgh for two years. And we're going to start looking for another venue in the US. Um, I did many years ago look into Boston. It's kind of expensive, which probably you already knew that. Uh, so I don't know if it would be in Boston, but it will be somewhere else in the US. And it's super fun. I highly encourage putting that on your schedule. Um, aside from the event, the Python Software Foundation is also the nonprofit uh, vendor neutral home for the Python programming language. So we provide support and infrastructure um, for the global community of contributors, uh, including meetups all over the world like this one, uh, other PyCons that happen in other places like Colombia or Australia or New Zealand um, or Berlin. Uh, and uh, we also work with the steering committee to help them coordinate the releases and the bug and the feature requests, like to make sure that those all get like promoted and sent to all the places where people want to hear about them. Um, more importantly, we also make sure that Python remains an open source community directed project. Uh, you can probably think of like other projects that, you know, might have started out kind of community minded and then sort of just morphed over into being like a side project that just one company works on. Uh, because the Python Software Foundation holds the Python programming language and all its intellectual property, uh, that doesn't happen to Python. It remains open source and community driven. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so, uh, and that means that anyone can contribute to it and it means that anybody can propose patches or bugs that they'd like to see fixed. <clears throat> Excuse me. <coughs> so right now we get a lot of patches from, <clears throat> sorry, I really went down the wrong throat there. Um, <clears throat> folks who are primarily programmers, but I'd love to see um, the language get stuff from folks that are not primarily programmers, like engineers and biologists and physicists, because um, a lot of them use Python every day. Uh, the last, like, I would say another thing that we do is sometimes we pay people to work on code or infrastructure, uh, and we're hoping to expand the number of folks that do that. We have, um, <coughs> in the last year, Lukash Langa, who uh, became the first PSF developer in residence, and he works on uh, CPython and amplifying the effect of volunteer contributors. We also brought on Shamika Monahan, who uh, works as the Python packaging project manager uh, last year. And uh, she's working on visioning and strategy, strategizing on how to make the packaging more efficient and more responsive to what people want to see. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, looking ahead, we're also looking to um, expand the number of code and technical amplification work that we pay folks to do. Um, and so that might, there might be jobs at the PSF at some point in the future where people are able to, um, you know, come and work at the PSF and help us get things done. So keep an eye out for that. Um, one of the other things that the PSF does is we uh, have a grants program where we give away money to uh, projects and meetups that are holding events or doing something, some kind of tutorial or some kind of activity for the community. And we've given away up to $117,000 this year, uh, $117,000 this year, which is pretty exciting. But that's a little less than it has been in previous years because we were um, kind of had to scale down a little bit during the pandemic. A lot of events got canceled or uh, things that people were gonna do in person got canceled. But we give grants out to Python groups and projects all over the world. And a lot of them are, um, starting to do in person or starting to do hybrid, or we've been supporting a lot more virtual events over the last year and a half. So <clears throat> if you can think of a project that you think is uh, helping the Python community as a whole, 
we'd love to hear from you and uh, have them get in touch with us. And then finally, we have a fiscal sponsor program, which is 13 different organizations, including Boston Python. And we support a mix of groups uh, like meetup groups, but also some key technical infrastructure. And um, we help them with like accounting and admin. Uh, we help Ned buy pizza for the Boston Python meetup and not have to do it from his own personal bank account. Um, and in the future, we're hoping to add a little bit more uh, strategic help, either through Skillshares or seminars on topics that will help our fiscal sponsors like grow and thrive and share information with each other and things like that. So um, those are some of the things that we're kind of looking to do. Um, one of the way that we do all this is uh, through donations from individuals, but mostly from corporate sponsors. So uh, if you think your boss would want to write us a big check, I would totally love to hear from you about that. Um, and, uh, you know, but also there's lots of opportunities to volunteer with the foundation, either through the code base, um, or uh, we have folks that volunteer to help us design stuff or help us uh, figure out how to make our documentation better for newcomers and things like that. So there are loads of ways to be involved with the, uh, the larger community that ties all of the different meetups together. Um, it's, it's an incredibly diverse uh, kind of, you know, everybody all over the world uh, working on Python together. Yeah, I can um, put some links in the chat. Yeah, the simplest link is python.org. Yeah, that is the best one. Um, <clears throat> but I can also, if people need specific links for that one, you can find out how to donate, how to volunteer, and learn about the fiscal sponsorship program. They're all like on that top navigation. So um, yeah, so lastly, I just wanted to say, um, I think one of the things that uh, we haven't done as much of, just nonprofits get really busy with limited resources, is uh, we're really interested in hearing from the community about how they think we could serve the larger Python community better, or how like we could specifically serve the um, our fiscal sponsorees like Boston Python better. So. Um, I'm, I'm brand new, so uh, I, I haven't heard all the ideas a hundred times before. So it's a great time to tell me what you think we could be doing better or be doing more. Of. So thank you so much. Uh, that's what I have. All right. Great. And I would be happy to take a couple questions if folks want. Uh, so to, to keep things calmer here, you can, people can no longer unmute themselves. So uh, right. ask questions in the chat. Uh, we'll read them out if need be. Um, Thanks, Deb, for coming. I, I had asked Deb to come to the last lightning talk, and she was like, no way, Py PyCon. I can't even think about anything else. Right. Like, and I had only started like 10 days before. Right. I would have been coming in and saying, like, right. I have no idea what we yeah. do, but I work don't, here now. Don't even know how to spell PSF, right? No. <laughs> um, does anyone have any questions for Deb about what PSF and what it does? I know that when I when I am... Um, seeing the kinds of things that PSF does. It's all over the world, you know, a grant for what to me looks like a small amount of money, but in the countries where it's going to actually makes a huge difference for like a group that wants to run an event on an afternoon or whatever. And, you know, Boston yeah. Python is lucky to be basically self-funded by sponsorships, but the PSF helps us by holding our money and giving us debit cards that we can use to buy the pizza and all that stuff which is way better than it used to be when, as Deb mentioned, it would go onto one of our credit cards and we had to get reimbursed. And it's yeah, it was definitely like a not me buying the pizza yeah. <laughs> like kind of situation before. Right. Um, and yeah, like, and it's, it's a pretty wide breadth of stuff like where we have, um, you know, like Pi Ghana, uh, where like a couple hundred dollars is a huge amount of money there. Pizza yep. Supply Foundation, I like that. <laughs> um, and then, uh, but then we also have like the Pie Ladies chapter, which is global and has within itself like hundreds of other chapters. So it's like, um, and that's a huge, huge, huge one. Um, so Nick, Nico asks uh, how volunteers work. And so it depends on what you want to do. Like um, we have a lot of working groups that are listed on the website and some of those might sound interesting to you. Uh, and we also have like a discourse where uh, people have conversations about the technical stuff. So I don't, I think Ned, I've seen your name on the discourse before, yep. but that's where a lot of the conversations um, around like the 
peps happen, like people that are uh, talking about new uh, features or bugs or changes to the language to update it. I will say, I, like within getting this job, like one week later, someone asked me if we could go back to Python two. That's a, still a no. <laughs> okay, good. Regime change, down. not doing yeah. it. Right. Um, Hasir Amira says, you mentioned PyCon trying to come to Boston. Have regional conferences seen big success in more expensive cities? Um, I don't think we will come to Boston for a while unless someone has some kind of like a hookup or we did something like a little ways out, like maybe a collaboration with Brandeis or something like that that's a little cheaper. Um, but you, we tend to go through, um, go to like sort of more modestly sized cities. Like we were just in Salt Lake City um, and then our next one will be Pittsburgh. Right, now Jose no. mentioned regional conferences. So I think maybe he's thinking about things oh. like Pi Ohio and Pi Texas. Yeah, uh, there are a bunch of those. Um, I mean, I would love to see one of those in Boston because I'd certainly attend because I live right here in Cambridge. Um, but yeah, some of them are very successful and some, uh, you know, probably that we've never heard of or less successful, but, uh, but we can help you try to figure out like a time plan, like a timeline and like a game plan for trying to figure out how to do that. Um, it's something that we have helped a lot of local PyCons, so we have a lot of institutional knowledge um, and we know a lot of the things that are best practices. Um, most of them come down to don't try and do it six weeks after you thought of it. Um, but, uh, you know, but we have some more specific advice that we could share as well. All right. So we're going to do it seven weeks after we thought of it. Got it. Seven. Right. Um, oh my gosh. Um, Phyllis is I, going to be so mad at me. Um, <laughs> I will say, I will say that I think different cities have different styles of pulling their community together. And, um, Boston has tended to have monthly or multiple monthly events all around the year rather than putting all the energy into a regional conference. It doesn't mean it can't be done. It just means that we might need to find more people to spread all of that energy around into. Yeah, I think something that might be really interesting. Uh, so for the last couple of years, PyCon has had a charlist track, which is a Spanish language uh, track co-located with it. And that uh, we have a lot of Spanish speakers in the Boston area, like um, do we, that might, be enough of an additional kind of special thing that uh, happens that would make Pi Boston like a more successful than just a regular meetup. Um, yeah, it would require a lot of energy. Um, I know that you can always tell Ned if you have extra time to volunteer on Python too. Absolutely. Uh, he's, he's always open for that. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. That would be super that would be super cool. I think we have a really large community here. Um, you know, and uh, I think the one thing that I would say as far as cost, so for PyCon, the main PyCon, it's like a 3,000 people or so. Uh, and so some of the things that uh, we can't do is hold like a 400 person event at a school. So you could do that locally, um, but like, PyCon US is way too big to have a school donate like a, you know, a half dozen rooms and be a partner. So that might be a way to go about trying to figure out how to do a PyCon in Boston that's local, that uh, is less expensive than renting out Heinz Convention Center. Right. James, what's up? Uh, yeah. Uh, hi, Deb, and uh, welcome, I guess, to uh, your role in the director, and congratulations. Uh, and Thank thanks you. very much for stepping into that that space. Um, at PyCon US, speaking of PyCon, um, I was really impressed by the closing keynote by Naomi Cedar. I can't wait till that yeah, publicly I love available. Yeah, I that too. Um, so in, in that keynote, she, uh, she mentioned that she wants to, let me make sure I don't mince words here or get the wrong words. She said something along the lines of the Python community needs to avoid becoming a, uh, a business. Yeah. Um, Open-ended question. Can you share your thoughts on, um, I guess, on that keynote and specifically that part of it? Like, what, is yeah. that, what does that mean and how do we do it from the perspective of the PSF? 
Yeah, uh, so I had to cut out a couple minutes before the end of Naomi's keynote because I did the community service awards right after that and they had to mic me up. But um, the part that I did here, I would say she's absolutely correct. Like um, when I said that we're a nonprofit home, that means that we're incorporated uh, it, like, as a charity. So that means that our mission is to serve the public good in some way, like education or access or something like that. Um, our mission is to share Python and help people learn Python and grow the Python community, uh, but also to keep it uh, a resource that can be used by anyone. Uh, and so part of, part of how we keep uh, PSF and the Python community from becoming a business is already like uh, made a little bit more of a downhill travel by being incorporated as a charity. So a lot of the things that happen uh, to for profits, even when they have the best intentions, they become beholden to shareholders who, you know, their duty to their shareholders is to make the most money as possible. We don't have that because we're a charity. Uh, and we don't have shareholders that we answer to. Um, the other thing I would say is that uh, that also means like figuring out how to uh, get the like some of the interest in adding onto the language or doing things and doing as much as we can to bring that in under our umbrella with our steering council, with the Python community and not having people fork and do stuff that uh, isn't available to the wider community. So, I mean, obviously everyone has little tweaks and things that they do at home, but if they're gonna, you know, make big suggestions for big changes to the language, it has to go through the community process still. So um, a good example of, uh, of what like a nonprofit charitable home can do is if you look at the Git software. So there are two completely different businesses built on top of the Git software, but because Git has a nonprofit home, uh, neither one of them can affect the core and uh, you know make the code base irritating for their competitor. So that's like a fairly simple idea, but like Python has a lot more players and a lot more companies and a lot more people involved. But we also have a large enough presence, I think, and a lot of buy-in on making sure that it remains a resource that is available to everyone and is welcome and welcoming to everyone and uh, is accessible for everyone. Does that answer your question? He's muted again, but I'm just... oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, oh, John's. By the way, I'll, I'm remembering that. Uh, Glyph Lefkowitz, who used to live in Boston, the yeah. creator of Twisted, once said about Boston Python, it's like having a PyCon every month. So uh, it's another style. Anyway, if people want to make, people want to get a thing going, come, as John said in the, in the chat here, come to Slack, come to the organizing channel. Let's see what happens. And I'll just drop my um, email in there for folks. Um, if, uh, oops. So... Deb is probably still reachable as deb at bostonpython.com is my guess, but oh, it, it might be broken. Sure yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, now I'm just deb at python.org. Deb at python.org. So, um, Edward, is that question for everyone or uh, did you just want to speak to, you could contact me about that. Just kind of asking about community engagement and outreach to younger folks. And underserved folks. Okay. All right. Well, yeah. thank you, Deb. Thank you. Um, our next two talks are actually from uh, uh, PyCon attendees about PyCon. Um, first up is Glenn. Glenn, are you ready to go? Sure. Slideshow. There we go. We good to go? Go. Okay. Here we go. I start my timer. Here we go. First off, I got to apologize to everybody. I'm a little bit of a storyteller. So I'm going to just tell a story about my experience with uh, PyCon 2022. Uh, I've been around Python for about 18 months. Most of my time has been hanging out at office hours and learning things from Boston Python. 
I said to my boss one day when I saw PyCon 2022 coming out, I sent him an email that said, hey, I'd like to go to PyCon 2022. Would you like to pay for it? He said, how are you going to, you know, he said, I need a justification. So I thought a second, I sent it back and I said, you get two choices. Either one, you assume I already know everything or two, you assume I need to learn something else. And if you assume that I need to learn something else, either you have to figure out how to teach me or send me somewhere where I can get taught. So he agreed to send me to PyCon. And then I started asking questions at office hours because I wanted to make sure that I did PyCon 2022 correctly. And I wanted to make all the right choices and do all the right things. I wanted to make sure I packed the right clothes. I'm an analyst. Now I know I deal with Python that lets you do a couple of things a couple of different ways from time to time, but I'm always looking for the right way to do this. But if you didn't know that PyCon 2022 was about making decisions, their website, you had two choices on whether you wanted to look at the night or the day mode of what the website looked like. So it started out by making decisions that way. So to go to PyCon, I had to get travel set up. So to get there, I jumped on a bus in Concord, went down to the airport with my little thing in Logan, first time in Logan. So I got through security, had plenty of room inside of my uh, flight here as I get my, I didn't say my boss sent me first class to PyCon, but he put me in the back of the airplane. I got there and the neatest thing that I first learned when I got to Salt Lake City was that the train that goes from the uh, airport to downtown costs $2.50. It's a really clean train. It's a lot less crowded than the T, um, but if you're used to the T or something like that, it's a real easy ride just to get into the center city and do things and not pay $35 to take an Uber. So anyway, so that got me there. So the first thing, because I wanted to get everything, is I had to pick what tutorials I wanted. First things first. I watched and I registered the first day that it came out and I got registered for four tutorials. Um, I talked to a lot of people out there that the tutorials were full. They will sell out, get them simple. I made decisions and I asked a lot of questions in office hours about which one to go to. I talked just real briefly about this one about decorators because Reuven didn't actually teach it. They pulled off a miracle. He got stuck in flight and we got a substitute teacher and that did just an excellent job. And some other people that were there got, uh, oh, they got canceled. Their tutorial didn't run at all. So they had to think of other things to do and meet with other people. But that that was OK, um, because if you don't want to pay 150 bucks a piece for each tutorial, there's other things to do. I could have went to the Typing Summit or the Python Language Summit or the Educator Summit. There were just all kinds of other things to do on the two days before the conference actually started. And it gave me an opportunity to get acclimated. I met with. Uh, Jose and Emily, when we were out there, we went to a restaurant that had a robot that brought food to our table. It was kind of cool. So this was one of the neater shortcuts that I that I took out there. I'm at my first conference and I got my first time attendee badge. And I got this ask me, I'm happy to help button because I figured I could outsource things that I didn't know. Um, the first thing I will tell you is if you go to Salt Lake City, it took somebody telling me this. When you go into the bathrooms, they got these little green things on the on the on the doors uh, as to whether they're locked or not. And they were all green. And I kept pulling on them and pulling on them. And I couldn't get into the stalls. And eventually somebody said, push. And that helped. So it's the amount of knowledge that sometimes people don't have is just kind of different. But there's all kinds of things to volunteer to do. I could have people come up and ask me a question about something that I had nothing about. And the two of us would then go solve whatever their question was. And I could learn from that. So that was that. Was that. Now, there was an app. And I planned out an entire day of going down through all these different options because I wanted the absolute best course to get through the day. So I had an app and I had an entire full day of everything scheduled to do that. The first day I missed every one of the things I had planned because I ended up doing the entire or track of things. I went to the trade show. I spent time talking to all the different vendors that were at the trade show. Now this is an old picture Apparently, these people are from Boston, the Boston area, or at least some people that Ned, that Ned knows. The middle um, guy is Jack Diedrich from Boston. Yes. Okay. The, I went to the first time attendee. I went to the first time attendee thing. Uh, and one of the things they talked about was meetings in the hallway. And they talked about this Pac-Man formation. If you're going to meet in the hallway where three people would get together, 
And that way your fourth little person could come here and walk in and join the conversation. So you get four people that are talking in, in the hallway. Then they had these things called open spaces where people would just put numbers, names of things on the board. And you could, it's impossible to pick the absolute best thing to do all the time. So it's kind of get into just doing whatever it is that, that you think would be a, a, a good thing to do. I went to the sprints, which I now know if I was actually at PyCon, they would be pulling me off stage because my alarm went off that I just went past five minutes, listen to different people do different talks on different things. There were part Anaconda had a phenomenal uh, get together one evening that they just invited everybody over. So there's different events going on in the evening. So there's something to go. I think after getting my meals and stuff included, I think only two or three times that I have to worry about what I was going to eat at any point in time. It was just all kind of there. Um, but so there was lots of different, different items that direction. Uh, and then I stayed for the sprints and I got to work on hypothesis, um, which I got to make a contribution. Now I'm relatively new at this. My entire contribution to, to hypothesis was really simple. I was reading the, the documentation to set it up and install it so that I can make a contribution and it didn't work. <laughs> so we fixed the documentation along with me getting it installed so that somebody else coming along could do that. And they told me afterwards that having somebody with absolutely no knowledge that was willing to volunteer was quite helpful because they don't normally get that. Um, the other thing that I would, if I would recommend for somebody going to their first time, the things that you just really have to do, go to the newcomer's orientation. It's worth the time to go there. It'll give you tips on that. A lot of things that I just said really quick, I'll cover that. Go to the mentor sprints because that gives you the ability then to contribute and be part of the gifting, gifting community that Python's made up of. Go to the Pi Ladies auction. If you go to the Pi Ladies auction, you get tickets, buy an extra ticket. You will have somebody else that's there that said, I didn't get a ticket and they sold out. You'll meet a friend, take them to the Pi Ladies auction with you there. Be brave, put something down on the open space, hold your own open space, talk to people, whatever you want to talk about. I do want to mention this funny device right here. When you go to the Pi Ladies auction, take your wallet. It's a worthwhile cause. This is, I, Ned probably had one of these when they were when they were new. This is an IBM Luggable. This is a really good computer because it had two floppy drives. So it was easy to copy your, you know, you could run your program in one and your database in the other one. It only weighed about 35 or 40 pounds. This sold at auction, I think for $2,500 raising money for the Pi Ladies Foundation, which was really a, a, a neat organization. I met many people there that they had paid to get to the event on their own. And they would have never made it there. So it was it was kind of cool that way. They auctioned off a lot of a lot of fun stuff that night. So um, this is my contact information. That's not really what I look like. Uh, and this was my about this is after the first day, my haul of t-shirts. I collect t-shirts. Uh, I think I left with 27. I ended up leaving some sweatshirts that I took out there with some of the homeless people because I couldn't fit it all in my luggage because I had all these neat new Python t-shirts. Uh, but if you go around and talk to every vendor one-on-one, -on -one, you can get a, a new t-shirt wardrobe. But anyway, that was my experience there. I will at that point stop sharing my screen. So thank you. All right. Uh, thanks, Glenn. I think you've perfectly captured the, the friendly, overwhelming energy of PyCon in your talk. Uh, I felt like I was there. Um, cool. So Jane, there are a few people, oh, people are clapping. I'm, I'm, I'm misinterpreting clapping as raising hands. Why don't we do Jose's talk about his first PyCon, and then we can do maybe questions or reactions after the two of them. Would that be okay? Is Jose here? I didn't, he is here somewhere. I don't see him on the screen. Oh, and Isabel is here from Pi Ladies Columbia. Holy cow. Um, I can't find Jose. Are you here okay. somewhere? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Are you sharing the screen? You got something to share? Uh, not yet. Okay. Well, but you will. Okay. That's all I'm trying to say. Uh, so one of the downsides of the pandemic is we don't get to meet face to face. Uh, one of the upsides of the pandemic is that we can have events where people from Colombia are dropping in. Uh, and Glenn, who for some strange reason has chosen to live so far north of Boston that he wouldn't be able to get into the city easily. So. Okay, can you guys see my slides? Yeah, it looks good. 
Uh, okay. Hey, everyone. Um, so I'm also presenting on my uh, first uh, PyCon. I titled it Maybe Med PyCon uh, because I got a chance to participate in the Charles track there uh, and, and uh, got in touch with the uh, Spanish speaking community. So it was a great uh, memorable experience. So speaking of memorable experiences, I have a few pictures here um, from the trip. So uh, right before the right before the trip, I actually forgot my laptop on the the flight. <laughs> That's why I have a picture in my bag. Uh, so I was scrambling at the last last moment, uh, freaking out about getting the laptop uh, before the tutorials. But I made it happen. Um, on the right at the top uh, top right corner, you could see the robot that uh, Glenn referenced. <laughs> from the Thai restaurant we uh, we uh, went to after the tutorials. Um, so it was a lot of fun. Uh, and uh, right next to that, you can see a picture that I took with some of the uh, speakers from the um, Charles uh, tracks. Um, at the bottom, uh, just uh, some pictures of some of the uh, tutorials that I got a chance to attend. So I'll go over those next. Um, so the first one I was uh, involved in uh, was uh, knowledge graph uh, data modeling with Terminus DB. Uh, completely, completely new topic for me, uh, knowledge graph um, uh, on its own. I learned a lot about uh, how uh, the data is structured in uh, knowledge graphs. So I learned what a, what a triple is, uh, how those are um, linked together to uh, create a, uh, View of the world um, and how uh, how to uh, how it works with unstructured data um, and and makes uh, terminus makes uh, life easier for uh, things like querying. Um, it's similar to uh, Mongo, but it provides like a like layer on top of it. Um, so uh, very uh, thorough. Uh, thorough dive into the topic uh, for my uh, first time. It was a really well done uh, tutorial. Uh, the second one I attended was on WebAssembly. Um, so this was also uh, really well done. Uh, the instructor provided a Gitpod environment for us to uh, have the same uh, environment he uh, intended to uh, guide us through. Um, so I learned about uh, Pyodyne uh, and its uh, uses uh, for running uh, WebAssembly in the browser. Um, I learned about uh, WebAssembly not having had a uh, background in assembly for uh, a while. I learned a little bit about MIPS in my undergrad. Um, so I had a little bit of background, but it was uh, nice to get uh, the WebAssembly take on, on uh, assembly language, and we wrote a compiler uh, for a made-up uh, language in, in Python. So uh, very well-guided uh, tutorial. Um, it was one of my favorite uh, parts of uh, PyCon, actually. Uh, the last tutorial that I, I attended was uh, testing mitigating fairness in AI systems with FairLearn. Um, so FairLearn is a open source uh, data science toolkit for assessing uh, and mitigating fairness in AI systems. Uh, this tutorial I, I felt like was more geared towards uh, data science, so I felt, felt a bit out of place with my background, but I learned a bit more about um, the considerations that are uh, taken uh, in terms of, of making uh, machine learning models uh, more fair. Uh, and the metrics that are used to uh, sort of measure that. Uh, I learned a lot about uh, the package and um, the useful uh, stuff that it provides, such as a data sheet for uh, kind of signing off that uh, that uh, mitigation tactics has, have been used. Um, so I won't go over uh, all the talks uh, you saw from uh, Glenn said there was uh, a lot to, to choose, uh, but um, yeah, so, so uh, before the, the talk, I expected a really hectic schedule. If you, if you saw, uh, there were many talks to choose from. Um, so uh, 
before one of the top Python talk days uh, over here on the left, I, uh, did, I prepared with uh, run installed on Python. Uh, so it was a lot of fun. Um, I got a chance to volunteer uh, as a session chair for the Charles track. And as I uh, mentioned before, it was a great way to uh, get involved with uh, the Spanish speaking community there at PyCon and uh, network with the uh, speakers. Uh, another great way to network was the hallway track. Uh, I met a lot of authors of uh, uh, Python books uh, and uh, podcast hosts and, and all that stuff. Um, the new co newcomer orientation uh, that Glenn mentioned was really helpful in uh, preparing for what's to come and what to expect. Um, I kind of uh, prepared beforehand to uh, go to a lot of the talks, but I noted that next time I need to make more use of the open spaces. Um, since those seem to have a lot of interesting uh, topics as well. Um, some notable talks I attended were uh, animating NFL play-by-play -play data using funk animation. So this uh, walked through kind of uh, creating a slideshow just using the matplotlib uh, library um, in 30 minutes. Uh, it was a lot to cover, but uh, very nice to uh, See that matplotlib has that type of uh, functionality. Um, open source on easy mode was also useful for um, uh, sharing uh, sharing ways to get involved in uh, open source and uh, how to uh, make your contributions more efficient. Um, handling time zones in Python was also uh, really useful to uh, get a perspective on um, the new uh, time zone library that's uh, being used in Python, uh, Zone Info, I believe it's called. Um, so I got got actually to see a second robot uh, during the time I was there. So I was thinking Salt Lake City is much more high tech than I uh, imagined. So this this uh, this robot actually sings and dances, and the the uh, the owner of the robot uh, said he leases out for birthday party. So uh, yeah, uh, didn't expect to meet two robots uh, while I was there. So the the sprints uh, were also a great time to um, uh, contribute and meet um, other people in the Python community. So I got involved in uh, a library called uh, GDS Factory. It's uh, used for creating uh, electronic design layouts uh, using uh, Python or YAML uh, instead of uh, the traditional uh, VHDL uh, type method. So uh, I was able to contribute to um, some of the uh, pre-commits they had for uh, uh, document documenting, it was the PyDoc style, um, Pre-commit, so uh, making sure that the that the doc strings are up to uh, the Python style um, configuration. Uh, so that's it. And here's uh, my contact info if you'd like to get in touch for any of these uh, topics. All right. Thank you, Jose. Uh, I. I'll, I'll, I just want to clarify a few things that people said. Um, they used the word hallway track, which is kind of a joke. The talks come in tracks, they're planned out. The hallway track is the thing you can do instead of going to the talks, but it's really just hanging out in the hallway and talking to whoever you happen to meet in the hallway. Um, and there are people who go to PyCon with the explicit plan to not go to a single talk, just do the hallway track the entire time. Uh, and I can recommend that. Uh, the idea is you could watch the talks later. Often I don't actually get around to watching the talks later. Uh, but the Holly track is is super good. Uh, anyone have any questions or comments for Glenn and and Jose? It is overwhelming. It is impossible to do everything at PyCon. You have to pick and choose. Um, the good thing is there are probably no bad choices, um, but it's easy to get that FOMO feeling of like, 
I'm in a great open space, but I also saw there were other great open spaces right now, and I, I can't do them all. So one of the questions here, how does one choose which sprint to go for? Um, to, to pick a, the sprints to go for, they actually, at, a, at the end of uh, the regular meetings and presentations, the people from the sprints got up front and pitched their sprint as to, why, as to which ones they wanted people to come to. And some of the people you had met, you could have met low, earlier on in, the, the, uh, in open space rooms. Uh, some of the people uh, just waited until the very end. Some of them were at the mentored sprint. That's how I ended up getting involved with mine because I stuck with the guy that I'd been in a mentored sprint with because I wasn't ready to jump onto something new yet. So, and and some some projects are very explicit at the sprints. Like we really want beginners. We're really here to help beginners. And some of them are like, you know what? Our project's really complicated, and we'd love to have your help, but we're mostly going to be heads down hacking on our project. And so you pick. Um, or maybe you choose to go to the project that you actually use day to day and you wish you could help out with or whatever. And sometimes the sprints, you know, you, you start one morning in a sprint and then you decide to go to a different place in the afternoon. You know, you can hop around. Yeah, don't tell anybody I, I didn't mention it. My talk on the second day of the sprints, I actually elected to go to the museum in Salt Lake City and take a minute to catch my breath. So. Yes, that's also recommended. Um, so there are questions coming in. Is there anything you wish you knew about PyCon before attending the first time? Yes. Yes. I was really concerned that I wasn't going to wear the right clothing. I've been to conferences before where like suit and tie were the, were the correct. No, I know that now. I've been yeah. there. But, but I, I had packed long pants and short pants. But after the first day, shorts and a t-shirt, that was me. So, right. and Emma, um, I would say, I would say, um, I wish I knew sort of like the differences between the tutorials and uh, the the talks. Um, just kind of, I tried to squeeze too many uh, talks in uh, one day, like I did with the tutorial. The tutorials are uh, longer, about uh, half a day uh each and it gives you more time to consume all the uh digest all the information um whereas talks are uh much more straight to the point and uh harder to uh do so much mm -hmm. right um I'll, I'll mention one other thing which is that glenn was talking about the things he could have done other than tutorials some of those things are actually invitation only like the language summit um mm -hmm. but the other the other ones i think the education summit is open and I forget what the other one was, but yeah, there are other things to do on the Wednesday and Thursday other than the tutorials. And I think my point on that would be to simply say if you couldn't, if your tutorial gets canceled, or if you want to go out there just for those days, there's plenty to do on those days with other Python type people. Yep. All right. Emily says she wished she knew that she should schedule some downtime. That's only because she had to put up with me and Jose. I, I, I had a friend once who had a talk accepted at PyCon, and he spent his entire time at PyCon up until he gave his talk, preparing his talk in his hotel room. And I would not recommend that as a way to do PyCon. I think, and she would have to speak for herself. One of the most frequent questions you get asked at PyCon is, is what do you do? And it's funny, on the first day, it's much less descriptive. People are like, I'm a software engineer. I do full stack development. As the as it goes on, people get a little bit more descriptive and a little, they kind of, they're getting more practice to that. I would say by the end, Emily probably could have answered that question for me because <laughs> uh, we'd all heard each other answer it mm. multiple times. So it's like, so. Yeah, so, so ne next year, I, as Deb mentioned, it's going to be in Salt Lake City again. The PyCon organizers figured out the trick of always doing it two years in a row in the same place to amortize the planning. Um, and then after that, it's going to be in Pittsburgh. Uh, keep in mind, if you plan to do prepare your talks on the plane, you'll have more time for Salt Lake than you will for Pittsburgh. So plan ahead. Um, all right. I think, thank you, Glenn and Jose. I think I'm excited for you and your first PyCon. I am very grateful that you uh, chose to share it with us. 
Um, can I can I share one other thing real quick? Yes. Only because only because Isabel Isabel is here. Hi, Isabel. Um, she she came in from uh, Colombia and constantly was volunteering in the Pi Ladies booth uh, and doing stuff with that for somebody at their first time conference. That I guess in the end, I wish I'd have been braver to volunteer to do more of that stuff being brand new. Mm -hmm. Yes, and by the way, I, you didn't mention, and maybe it didn't happen, it must have happened this year, a big thing in previous years has been stuffing the swag bags, which is a big uh, assembly line organizational thing where all you have to be able to do is walk around and put paper into bags, but you end up meeting all these people who are also volunteering to do it, and it's a lot of fun. Um, but yes, so John is mentioning that you can do a real PyCon talk. Uh, you can practice it here. By the way, the time zone talk that Jose mentioned uh, was done by Benjamin Zagorowski, who is in Boston and has already volunteered to come and do it for us in one of these times. So it can go in both directions. Um, all right, thank you. We should move on to our next talk. Um, I had said at the beginning that we were going to have six talks, but our sixth speaker isn't here. I don't expect him to show up. So this may be our last talk. Um, David, are you ready to get started? Let me let you unmute. Okay, uh, is my microphone working? It is working, good. Awesome. All right, I think I'm about ready. All right. So hopefully you can see some slides. Uh, I coding exercises. Excellent. I copied these, exported these to HTML and copied them across computers a minute ago. So we'll see how that goes. But yeah, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, interactive coding exercises. I guess if this was part of a series, it would be called stupid pie test tricks. But because this is about minimal self-hostable pie test based interactive coding exercises. And just to get us started, um, I guess I should explain what interactive coding exercise is. Like, what are they? Um, I've also heard these called coding challenges. And uh, it's complicated. Actually, I'm not sure if I'm even starting in the right place. I guess maybe I should start with what is what is a regular uh, coding exercise or coding challenge, if you prefer. And essentially, anytime you do some kind of an activity where there is a specification to write a unit of code, like write a function that does x, I don't know, translates Roman numerals into integers or what have you, it might ask you to use specific language features or not use specific language features. Uh, it may be broken down into steps or phases or, you know, once you get it working, here's an extra challenge you could try. And hopefully some kind of success criteria, like some indication of what your code should do when it's complete. Like, in other words, how do I tell if I did it correctly or not? Um, this may take the form of test data or example inputs and outputs, maybe a data file you can process. But generally, it's distributed, at least in the classic sense, on paper. Like there is a document, like a series of instructions. And it is, as a procedure, it is sort of run manually by the people who are trying to do it. Uh, which brings us to interactive coding exercises or coding challenges. See, we got there. Um, basically, uh, there are a lot of websites that do this now. Um, and this, this sort of comprises more like uh, an interactive environment, like a development environment where code can be implemented and automatically evaluated. So there's a system in place that can actually enforce the constraints. Like you actually have to use or not use those language features or requirements. Um, maybe it can incrementally or dynamically sort of release instructions or steps to you as you complete them. Um, hopefully with automated success criteria, like it can tell you if your code actually works or not. Um, it can tell you if you are quote unquote done or not. Uh, probably via some kind of test or assertion uh, that the code has the expected features or interfaces. Maybe they have a series of unit tests that are running behind the scenes to tell you if your code actually did the thing. Um, and typically, it only let you advance if your tests all if their tests passed, proving that your code works. And I think the best ones that I've seen also even provide context-sensitive device uh, or sorry advice. Um, maybe help you debug your code, maybe give you feedback, like maybe even like give you some kind of rank or score or other indication of uh, how well you're doing. So this is especially relevant to me. Um, I spend a fair amount of time both at my job and at meetups trying to teach people about social programming techniques. So pair programming, uh, what you might call mob or ensemble programming, basically programming as a group uh, cooperatively. And I also like to emphasize test-driven development, basically 
writing your tests first, proving that your tests work, making sure that your code is testable as you're writing it, which it turns out is actually a pretty good idea for long-term maintenance of code. And it's a similar situations arise where we do exercises or we say, you know, and TDD is test driven development for short, where we say implement a function only doing TDD and as a group, implementing the following features as a group, et cetera. And uh, I will say, uh, people, especially beginner and beginning engineers, engineers who haven't done these techniques before, people who haven't met each other before working as a group, have certain tendencies. Uh, they are maybe inclined to skip to the interesting part of a challenge or exercise. They may attempt to decompose that problem into functional units, although each participant may have a very different take on how to do that. They may forget that their code was supposed to be testable or to write the test first. They maybe have a hard time agreeing as a group, where should they start or how should they start? This is sort of a metaphorical image of four or five people all uh, trying to figure out how to start a project. Um, so uh, it's, it's a lot, but that interactive coding challenge, uh, those, those quality attributes that interactive coding challenges have are really useful. Um, they provide you step-by-step -step instructions that are harder to skip ahead in, either accidentally or on purpose. They have built-in acceptance or integration tests to ensure that you have actually completed a step before you can move on. And they have, essentially, they provide you with sort of a more guided progression through a project or challenge. But they're pretty hard to implement. Um, and I know because I work at a company that implements them and I, I have studied them and they tend to involve uh, containerization. They tend to involve a lot of stuff that your average person who is the target audience for a coding exercise is probably not going to be able to do, like just run your own Kubernetes cluster and you can totally run this programming challenge yourself. Um, I mean, obviously you could also subscribe to an online education service that sells these things, but I was trying to find something that you could just run on your own laptop or better yet, maybe just run in a browser even if such a thing is possible. But uh, I also have a lot of free time these days, uh, but I like to think that good engineers are creatively lazy, or at least that's what lazy engineers like to tell ourselves, <laughs> cough. But um, I'm also a big fan of PyTest, and PyTest does come up a lot in a lot of these exercises and in training. Uh, it is beginner friendly in some ways. It has a lot less process we just have to write functions with names that match a certain pattern. That pattern is also configurable. Um, it uses Python's built-in assertions and other simple constructs. You'd have to learn a lot to start using PyTest at least, at least to get basically started. Um, very minimal boilerplate. You don't need to write, you don't need to understand classes or imports or decorators to start writing tests, although it helps. Um, and it's not that PyTest is simple. It actually can get shockingly complicated if you want it to. It has a ton of advanced features which are also tend to be pretty sim simple and minimal in code. In fact, uh, it's also very extensible. Like it's not really correct to say that PyTest just has a plugin API. It's like, basically it is a highly extensible layered adaptable plugin API that just happens to have been used to build a testing framework. It's kind of crazy what it can do. And it started to occur to me at certain points that PyTest can actually do a lot of the stuff that I want an interactive coding exercise to do. It can run tests. It can change dynamically which tests it's running. It can give you feedback. It can show you, it can hide all of the system out, you know, all the print statements from your code, except for the code where the tests are failing. It does all these convenient things. And uh, I don't know if you've ever used PyTest or learned PyTest, but this is a good visual metaphor for what learning PyTest is like, especially if you're coming from older, like classic X unit, J unit style frameworks. It's sort of like if you were the cat or your brain is the cat and the flower is pie test, ah, there's, a, there's a very sad place for that gift to stop here. Let me, let me <laughs> load it manually. There we go. It helps if you play the soundtrack from Interstellar while this is happening. But it is, it is a, a mind blowing, mind expanding, consciousness altering experience in some ways once you really start getting into it. That's, that's what I'm trying to get at. There we go. Well, okay, you get the idea. So. Could we turn a simple repository of Python code, something you could just clone out of GitHub and start hacking on with no dependencies into an interactive challenge? Uh, I would say no, which is disappointing given the, the topic of this presentation. But here, could we, <laughs> let's just add one dependency. Let's just say, given that you have PyTest installed, uh, could we embed sufficiently advanced PyTest plugins and extensions in a repo that you could just check out of GitHub that would give you an interactive coding experience? 
Well, I'm out of slides, so I guess I will do a live demo. And just to adjust expectations, uh, live demos always go perfectly, and you should always do them. But uh, <laughs> I guess just be be patient, please. Uh, I will share my other screen. Uh, hopefully, you can see what yep. appears similar to a VS Code window. In so I didn't. Cool. So. Uh, I didn't have slides for this, but this is, uh, I'm trying this out. This is a newer part of this exercise. So this is Gitpod. This is a, a service that does have a free account level. So you can sign up for free on Gitpod with your GitHub or GitLab or uh, Bitbucket account, I think. And it does a couple of things for you. It allows you to basically check out, or take a repository and open it in a VS Code editor in a browser. It can automatically set up requirements for you. Um, so that gitpod.yaml file over here on the left, uh, which was actually auto-generated for me by Gitpod, knows that it, I it probably wants to install the Python extension and to install my Python requirements. So someone who tries to, who uses this project through Gitpod uh, can simply open this uh, and get a working environment with a terminal all ready to go, which is pretty cool. And you can share this online. It's not quite as good as VS Code Live Share, but Considering that it just works in a browser with no setup and no installation of anything, that skips an awful lot of the steps that normally make uh, Python exercises hard for beginners, at least to get started. And here are the instructions. Um, this is kind of a hack, oops, but uh, and an MVP, but I thought it was kind of fun and worth showing off. There's a folder in this project called spoiler alert keep out, as the name implies. Uh, you're not supposed to look in there, but that's where the magic happens. Also in that conftest.py, there is a whole series of Python or PyTest plugins and extensions in there uh, that make this magic happen. But if you're not familiar with PyTest, it's pretty easy to invoke. If you go into your terminal and you type PyTest in your project folder, it should just work. So it ran, it found one test in this test poker scoring file, and that test passed. And I, if I'm curious, I can even go look at that test. This is not a very good test. It asserts <laughs> true. Uh, and uh, it is running this file here, score poker hands, which is a function that doesn't currently take any arguments. So I think there's a, there's a fix me about that. It doesn't return anything. There's also some notes about that. And apparently it's supposed to implement poker scoring. So that's kind of my very minimal starting set here. There is a whole bunch of stuff hidden in a folder, of course. And we've added a couple of extra commands to PyTest, or I should say command line options to PyTest. One of the many, many things that PyTest lets you do is add additional custom options. So there are a couple of them here. I can run PyTest with the dash dash email option. So let's try that really quick. And that allows me to get an email from my virtual boss at this virtual online poker startup company. So my boss is asking me to let's get the basic API working. We want to accept two poker hands as strings and return a scoring result as an integer. I can't imagine us ever needing to change this API. And that sounds ominous. But don't worry about the rules and just submit when the API is in the right shape. Let's do this. So uh, our boss is referring to there's this rules command that I can run. And this is sort of the, the way to get the current spec. Um, right now, it just says the score poker hands function should accept two hands, which are strings, and return an integer. This will sort of accumulate uh, specifications as the project goes on. And I can also uh, run PyTest with dash dash submit. This is how I submit my code for approval by our virtual boss or possibly our virtual boss's QA team. So let's just try to do that right now. So when I run PyTest with dash dash submit, some interesting stuff happens here. First of all, PyTest suddenly finds 77 tests, which is a lot more than one. Uh, and you may have guessed those are inside that folder that I told you not to look in. And uh, it ran three of them, three of them passed, one of them failed. Uh, and I'm getting a failure and it's being unpacked to say score poker hands accepts two strings and it failed because it should accept two strings as arguments, but it didn't. And it's not showing me a stack trace. Um, this is kind of an interesting PyTest thing. PyTest is pretty good about showing you the context around your errors, but you can configure it to not do that in certain situations. So for example, uh, if I were to go into my score poker hands function here and I don't know, like raise an exception. I can still run PyTest to make our, so that I have this local test function here, which is kind of encouraging me to start writing my own tests. So I will just invoke my score poker hands function here in my, my local test. 
I can run that, I can fail it, and you can see PyTest is behaving normally. I'm running regular PyTest. It's finding just my sort of user space tests, the tests that I have written or hopefully edited here, and running those. And here I do actually get a stack trace. I'm getting all the cool PyTest behavior that I expect. And if I were to try to submit this, well, it's interesting. Now I get both. I get the stack trace that came out of my code, and I get uh, I see the test, my test that's running. And I also see that either integration tests here that are running and possibly failing. And oh dear, my computer may have just crashed. I think, did we lose David? Oh, can you hear me? I can hear you. OK. Video's frozen. Yeah, I lost video, and my screen is kind of blank right now. <laughs> I think I may be having a catastrophic Zoom event here. Well, uh, <laughs> I guess it'll be kind of hard to show you. Show you uh, I think we lost. It is a live demo. It is a live demo. Hmm. Um, well, you're going to have to do without the end of David's talk, I think. And it turns out that our sixth speaker is trying to get into the Zoom. We had locked the Zoom because of miscreants. Um, not sure he's going to be able to get in here. We might just have to have Alan another time. I don't know what to say about all this. So there have been some uh, difficulties. I apologize for all of those. Um, I want to thank our speakers. If David comes back, we can see the end of what he's done. Um, if not, we can, he'll, he, David does come to Project Nights and I'm sure would be glad to show this off to people who want to see it in more detail. Um, I want to thank our speakers. I know it is not always an easy thing to volunteer to speak in front of people, especially in our, our gremlin infested Zoom times, um, but thank you. Um, I hope some of you maybe got an inkling of something that you could speak about in the future. I will say once again, uh, we can help you find those talks. Everyone's got a talk in them. Uh, we can help you find your topic if you want. Um, uh, we've got a question actually here for Deb. I don't know if Deb is still on the line about when the PyCon videos might show up. Do we have it? Oh, you have to, sorry. Uh, yeah, they're coming. It was um, our usual AV team for the videos is based in Canada and didn't want to come to the US because of COVID this year. And so um, there were some bumps with the new AV team that is based in uh, Utah. So um, there's actually a post on the website about it and we're working on it. It's looking like uh, Friday we should have keynotes and then next week the rest of the talks will trickle through. Uh, we, we PyCon attendees have been spoiled in the past with absurdly short turnaround times for videos going online, something like less than 24 hours, uh, which I don't, I don't understand how that's possible. Um, uh, I apologize for not, for both to Alan Downey for being locked out and for people who are hoping to hear Alan Downey, we will get him into the next month's talks. Uh, we will be a little bit smoother about dealing with the vagaries of Zoom. Um, thank you all for coming. I know Zoom fatigue is real. I really appreciate you joining us in whatever way you can from wherever you are. Um, thanks to Deb. Thanks to Glenn. Thanks to Jose. Uh, thanks to Juan, who has left. And thanks to David, who may still be out there somewhere trying to get things to work. Um, the video will go up. Um, maybe I'll try to edit out some of those little bits in the middle. We'll see. Um, but thanks for coming. Please see us on Slack. Come to office hours. Uh, keep your eyes peeled for the event notification about the collaboration night. And we will see you around. Thanks for coming.